Good morning and welcome to worship on this festival of Pentecost Sunday. I'm Pastor Haley V. Beeman, and traditionally this is a day in the church where we encourage folks to wear red in celebration of the Holy Spirit. Today I have on my tunic from my family in Guatemala and of course my red shoes that only come out so often happy to be wearing those today and in the background you'll see um, the banner that i have from my first call in pennsylvania uh, which calls to mind the fruit of the spirit which we'll hear about in paul's letter to the galatians later today i wonder if you're wearing red let us know in the comments will you and let's have a little bit of Pentecost fun. I want to invite you to post some fun red emojis in the chat and let's see what you come up with. I'd like to extend a special welcome this morning to guests who are worshiping with us. If you feel comfortable, please say hi in the comments so that our congregation can welcome you. Today, I believe our virtual greeter is my friend, Emma Rep. Everyone is welcome to share celebrations you have in the comments. I invite you to start writing and sharing those now while I highlight a few announcements for the coming weeks. You're welcome to join us for Pub Theology on Zoom this Thursday, at, uh, sorry, Tuesday at seven o'clock. The link uh, to connect on Zoom is in our weekly announcements. If you have kids in your household or know of any, age three through sixth grade who would enjoy either or both of our virtual summer camps, Compassion Camp and Youth Music Camp. We encourage you to check out those details on our ULC website where you can also register for camp before June 14th. Camp is happening the entire month of July on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. If you have questions, please reach out and let us know so that we can help keep you connected. Hopefully by now you have it, um, heard the exciting news, but in case you haven't, the end is in sight for our mortgage on our ULC building. As we come upon this milestone, there is no better time to think about what God's vision for our church and our community is for the future. Our council um, has been hosting small group discussions to engage our congregation in prayerful consideration of what's next for us. And I hope that you'll take advantage of this opportunity for everyone's voice to be heard as we discern how best to use the funds that will be freed up when ULC's mortgage is paid off. To participate, just send a quick email or phone message to register. I actually put the link already in the chat on this live video, so you can check out the details there. That information is also available on our ULC website and in the email um, from our weekly announcements. We ask that you please pre-register so that we know how to prepare. And the next small group discussion is scheduled for Wednesday, June 2nd, 6.30 to 8 o'clock in the evening. So you can mark your, your calendars now and make sure you register. The final opportunity is Thursday, June 10th. We hope you'll be part of that conversation. This week, our church council approved a fluid plan to guide our return to the building as we emerge from this COVID-19 pandemic. We recognize that as the pandemic continues to evolve, we may have to adapt these plans, and so they will remain flexible. A letter from Pastor Gary explaining these guidelines was emailed from our church account this week. So if you didn't get that, let us know, or you can visit our ULC website and Facebook page to check out those guidelines. If you haven't already, please read that letter or go to our website for the guidelines so you can know more information on our plan. But before we return to worship indoors, we are hoping to gather outside this summer for a brief service of Holy Communion following worship online on Sunday mornings. Our plan is to offer this twice a month at 11.45 in the morning, and we will begin that service on June 6th. That Sunday, June 6th, we'll have a brief, brief order of Holy Communion in the ULC parking lot. And we hope you'll mark your calendars and look forward to sharing in the sacrament of Holy Communion and some much anticipated in-person fellowship. As part of our ULC COVID return plan, 
we are encouraging vaccinations. And with the support of the Faiths for Vaccines initiative, I wanna share with you a short video before we get to those celebrations from prominent faith leaders in our own denomination and wider church who explain how receiving the vaccine is an expression of love for our neighbors. Last spring, our lives were upended with the sudden onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Just at the time of the year in which we would usually gather as families and communities. To celebrate our most sacred and precious holy days. Passover. Easter. Ramadan. A global virus emerged that prevented us from drawing near to one another. Now a year later, we find ourselves in a new spring. With a renewed hope and the chance to heal thanks to a life-saving vaccine offering us a chance to come together once again. However, this virus, which prevented us from coming together, can only be defeated by coming together in practicing life-saving measures, such as taking the vaccine, wearing a mask, and continuing to follow CDC guidance. All of our holy books teach us the importance of loving thy neighbor. By committing to get the vaccine, we are making the decision to love thy neighbor rather than letting fear and indifference continue to plague our nation. Over the past year, we have suffered greatly. Both the sickness of the virus and the sickness of our division. The hope of the vaccine is the opportunity to emerge from this pandemic and to come together again with love and care for all our neighbors. For all our neighbors. For all our neighbors. Receiving the vaccine shows genuine concern for the health of others and care for keeping them safe. So join us, neighbor, in committing to receive the vaccine in committing to love thy neighbor. So we can come together to worship in our communities and to celebrate and cooperate together as neighbors once again. All right, so I'm gonna head over to Facebook. Of course, I mentioned earlier, we celebrate with our confirmands and their families and the entire church as they affirm their baptism later in worship. We are also celebrating with the Kiefer's on the visit that they get to have with their new grandson. Thank you, Miriam, for that compliment about my shoes. You know I love shoes. And thank you, Marge, as well. We're celebrating Hannah's 14th birthday this weekend. I love all the red emojis. This is so great. You know, Pentecost is the birthday of the church, so we have a lot to celebrate together this morning. Aurora turned six months old this week. Vicki and Michael celebrated their 28th anniversary. Congratulations. And Bo and Joanne Betcher, 67 years of marriage, that's beautiful. Happy National Turtle Day. Thank you, Rachel. I love that emoji too. And yes, we will include Jabril and his family in our prayers. Thank you, Bobby. Well, once again, welcome to worship. We are so glad that you are here. And we continue our worship this morning with the prelude.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Creative Spirit, loving Lord, you have adopted us as heirs of your resurrection promise, and we have inherited the gift and presence of the Holy Spirit. Inspired by your generosity, make us generous givers of all that you have first given us for the sake of the one whose fire of justice brings new life to all the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. On this last week of the narrative lectionary season, we experience the Holy Spirit's movement in the book of Acts and are reminded of the holy disruption that comes with the Spirit's presence. We appreciate the way that Paul draws out and builds up imagery and tradition from the Hebrew Bible at this moment of new community formation. The winds, the fire, the role of language, all on the Jewish festival called Shavuot that marks the giving of Torah to Moses at Sinai. We continue to wrestle with the balance in community life between having explicit shared norms and having a shared horizon that each person moves toward through their own individual discernment. And we hear the imperative from both Hebrew Bible and New Testament to lift our eyes from our own interests to something much bigger and greater. Our first reading on this Pentecost Sunday is from the book of Acts, chapter 2. A reading from Acts. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came the sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them abilities. 
Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I imagine for some of us, this is the first time hearing such a powerful and mysterious and unifying story. Some of you may recognize this story and the video because it was created last year for our first pandemic Pentecost. As you witness this story unfold, I'm curious about what memories and themes or feelings are evoked for you. I feel the unifying warmth and power of the Spirit's wind and fire emblazoned on the heads and hearts of those who seek to share the good news. Good news of beloved and expansive community gathered together in the unity of diversity. The festival of Pentecost comes from the Jewish celebration of Shavuot. The word means 50th and is used in the Christian tradition to mark 50 days after the resurrection. While in the Jewish tradition, the festival Shavuot marks 50 days after Passover. In this way, the giving of the Holy Spirit to the followers of Jesus in the book of Acts is meant to parallel the giving of the Torah to the people of God by Moses on Sinai. The Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts work together, reforming the Jewish holiday and transforming it into a Christian tradition. This is the point at which the two holy days 
become different celebrations. Pentecost, reminding followers of Jesus to be guided by the unifying power of the Spirit, while the community of Moses is guided by Jewish law in Torah. And a holy disruption is taking place. There's fire, earthquakes, lightning, smoke, and these physical earth elements disrupt the status quo, calling to heart and mind elements of creation that not only unite the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament, and the two traditions, Judaism and Christianity, but they remind those of us who are called to live and practice active faith in the world today of the unifying power of diversity, which is gifted and guided by none other than the Holy Spirit. So what is it about this story that makes it so powerful and inspiring? What about it grounds us in a Lutheran understanding of vocation? our unique individual callings, and our call to be the church together. What about it moves you? Moves you to be guided by the spirit and not the desires of this world. One part of this story that moves me is the fact that the very first act of the Holy Spirit is to make it possible for people to speak in their own native languages and understand each other. If you've heard the Pentecost story before, try to approach it with a blank slate, as if you were there that day. Try to grasp the sense of awe that surrounds the people. Can you imagine it? The Holy Spirit could have done this so differently, causing all the people to speak the same language. I mean, wouldn't that have been easier? to assimilate their cultures in something like a Holy Spirit-led erasure? The Spirit could have given everyone the ability to hear one common language, but it chooses to equip the apostles to speak in the languages of all the people who are there gathering, expanding their horizon, their worldview, their liturgical lens. This Spirit act of holy disruption calls on the church today to remember that the practices which have become most familiar, sometimes most sacred, and most common among us are not always how we most effectively and lovingly communicate the gospel among a new generation of believers who are gathered here to receive the good news. There is a wide diversity of opportunity that's possible in the church when we learn through the power of the Spirit just how to speak each other's language. When we learn about expansive welcome, asking the questions not only about who is included, but who is being excluded. When we reach out and lift up the idioms, cultures, and customs of not just those who are gathered, but of those who long for a place to gather. What the Holy Spirit empowers people to do is expand their understanding of community in Christ across cultures and color barriers with people who are different than me, who have a common mission, not a homogenous identity. Pentecost is the undoing of these human-made hierarchical norms norms that God will not own. Pentecost is not an erasure of cultural difference. It's a model of empowerment and collaboration and unity among people who have learned from their past and are ready and on fire to be the church in the future and present, in the midst of our diversity, to enrich the body of Christ and the reach that it has in the world. This holy disruption becomes an important theme in Paul's letters. And in his letter to the people in Galatia, he writes that there are individual gifts, but they're all guided by the one spirit, recognizing that language and culture and the ways we worship can either serve to unite 
or divide God's people. And what Paul's letter provokes is our call as citizens in Christ to pay attention when the Holy Spirit moves among us, to name the ways we see and experience its movement in and with one another, and to encourage and build up communities of faith that thrive on a unifying spirit of diversity, not division. This is a reading from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapters four and five. My point is this, heirs, as long as they are minors are no better than slaves, though they are the owners of all the property, but they remain under guardians and trustees until the date set by the creator. So with us, while we were minors, we were enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent the son born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of God's son into our hearts, crying, Abba. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. Live by the spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh, for what the flesh desires is opposed to the spirit, and what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. But I'm warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Have you ever heard the phrase, you are what you eat? This portion of Paul's letter to the Galatians really makes me think about what we put in our bodies, our individual bodies and our collective body of Christ. One thing I've learned about nutrition is that what you put in is what you get out. Food has the power to fuel, sustain, and nourish our bodies or contribute to its decay. The same goes for spiritual food. In this case, the fruit of the Spirit. What Paul is describing is the powers of God versus the powers of this world. The power of life versus the power of death. The power of loving kindness versus the power of hate. The power of unifying diversity versus the power of a divisive cancel culture. He's not talking about things that are ultimately mundane. He's talking about things that matter. People, relationships, and God. And Paul points out that there are competing ways of living life, some that are extremely tempting. You are what you eat is a rhetorical statement, of course, but it reminds me that what I put in my body is what I'll get out of it. If I only ever eat French fries and ice cream, which are two foods I thoroughly enjoy, I won't actually turn into French fries and ice cream, but I will risk becoming consumed by them. 
Similarly, if I drink too much wine too often or practice drug misuse, I can risk becoming consumed by it. If I choose self-deprecation and self-satisfaction over loving kindness and self-control, if I put my trust in false idols like social constructs and a desire for more money and more inequitable power, then I create a dependency on people and systems and desires that simply cannot in the end have the power to save me or anything and anyone else I try to destroy along the way. The same goes for the body of Christ. It's crucial for the future of the church that we fuel the body we have been called to care for with not only nourishing food, but with faith practices that are life-giving, sustaining the ways we are able to worship and serve in Christ's name throughout our community in this day and age, ways that stop limiting and start expanding our horizons ultimately equipping all of God's people to witness to the fact that the ways we have built walls and limitations concerning, concerning the church for so long cannot and will not be the way of the future. In a similar way that the Holy Spirit provides nourishment to our individual bodies, it also moves in, with, and under the body of Christ producing fruit that will last. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And Paul writes, there is no law against such things. By the fruit of the Spirit, we become a people who are fed to feed. Beloved children of God who are together fed and fueled by the power of the Holy Spirit so that we may be equipped and energized to feed the world by its fruit. This is how real change happens. When we allow ourselves to be guided, not by our own desires, but by the Spirit's lead. Recently, an acquaintance of mine who grew up in the Catholic tradition asked me about the church and why there were so many limitations in place. He said, does the church really think that's how it can make disciples? By excluding people over and over? Is that what Jesus would do? His question stemmed from having recently gone through eight months of premarital counseling with a priest who had agreed to co-officiate he and his fiance's interfaith wedding. But ultimately the church did not grant them the opportunity for marriage because the woman he's engaged to marry is originally from India and her family practices Hinduism. By contrast, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. As you'll witness a little later in worship, our compromains share their faith statements, and our youth are bold to proclaim the good news through their hope for a brighter, better future in faith. It's been a really tough year. And we've sat together with our confirmation youth through their classes, Pastor Gary, Louise, their youth leader, and I, teaching, leading, and then listening. Sometimes providing answers, but most often hearing what they have to say. Providing courageous space to ask real questions and still feel a profound sense of belonging in the church. Some of our youth question the credibility of scripture and the impact of church because it has been misused and misinterpreted for so long to condemn people, people of God, faithful people, people of color, the queer community, women and children, and people who practice their faith in ways other than Christianity. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, 
kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And there is no law against such things. Now, as Lutherans, we're often quite timid when it comes to talking about the Spirit. But this Pentecost, and after the year we've faced, I hope we feel encouraged. It's time to start talking more about the Spirit and its fruit that prepares us for ministry in Christ's name. I wonder what it would look like if we paid special attention to the Spirit's movement and practice naming it together on a regular basis. It may feel strange at first, but so did worshiping from home. Where do you see the Holy Spirit showing up today? Where do you feel its presence? Where do you long for the Spirit to guide you, your family, our congregation and community? What might it look like? And what might change if we truly allow ourselves to be Spirit-led and Spirit-fed? Might we become slower to judge and quick to listen love, and celebrate joy, less focused on what's right and wrong, and more centered in patience, generosity, and peace, less caught up in quarrels and divisive speech, and more apt to loving kindness and self-control. As the Holy Spirit rains down among us this Pentecost, these are the thoughts and questions we get to ask and discern together. And these are indeed the questions we need to be asking so that the resurrection promise of Jesus is not just something that happened over 2021 years ago, because it's happening here. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we get to join that movement, thanks be to God together embracing just who, what, and how the church is being called to be. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Amen.
This Pentecost Sunday and every day, we celebrate with our Confirmation youth, their families, and the entire church as they affirm their baptism. And we invite your responses at the noted times in bold print. I present Connor, Santi, Brian, Libby, and Hannah, who desire to make public affirmation of their baptism. Let us pray. Merciful God, we thank you for these young people who you have made your own by water and the word in baptism. You have called them to yourself, enlightened them with the gifts of your spirit, and nourished them in the community of faith. Uphold your servants in the gifts and promises of baptism, and unite the hearts of all whom you have brought to new birth. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? I renounce them. Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? I renounce them. Do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? I renounce them. Do you believe in God the Father? I, I believe, believe in God, God the, the Father, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You have made public profession of your faith. Do you intend to continue in the covenant God made with you in holy baptism? To live among God's faithful people? To hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper? To proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed? To serve all people following the example of Jesus and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth? If so, will you respond, I do and I ask God to help and guide me. And people of God, do you promise to support these young people and pray for them in their life in Christ? We do, and we ask God to help and guide us. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that through water and the Holy Spirit, you give us new birth. Cleanse us from sin and raise us to eternal life. Stir up in Connor the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Stir up in Santi the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Stir up in Brian the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Stir up in Libby the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. 
Stir up in Hannah the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence both now and forever. Amen. Amen. So let us uh, welcome these new young people in Christ. Want to turn the face, everyone? We'll welcome you. We rejoice with you in the, the life, life of, of baptism. baptism. Together, Together we, will we will give thanks and praise to God and proclaim the good news to all the world. Congratulations, Confirmands, and blessings on your continued journey in faith. Uh, we look forward to the ways that we'll continue being the church together. And there are plenty of roles for you to fill. As we continue with the sharing of our gifts and offerings, we thank you for being the church, willing to represent the power of the Holy Spirit and God's gracious generosity and expansive love in the world. We remind you that you can give for the first time or continue giving toward the ministry of our congregation and wider church by sharing your financial gifts through direct deposit, the donate button on our ULC website, or by mailing a check to ULC. A reminder also that our outreach of the month for May is Living Water Ministries, which includes a really cool ministry called Bridge Builders that provides anti-racism training um, for youth and young adults. Of course, to contribute to the May outreach, you can donate online or send a check to the church office, but please remember to note, uh, whether online or in your physical check, LWM for Living Water Ministry on your payment. Let us pray. As disciples brought the fruits of the early spring harvest, so we also bring the fruits of our labors and offer them to you for your glory. Bless these gifts and use us as ambassadors of your mercy throughout the world. Amen. We now get to share the faith statements of our ULC Confirmation Class of 2021. We're so proud of you. Faith comes in many forms, and well, I've found faith, for me, is like believing. Faith, for me, is like believing that you can overcome obstacles in life, or to have faith in yourself. Faith is like when you need someone to help in life, you believe you can get it. Faith is believing you can get to the top of that roller coaster. Faith can also be like hope, like hoping that you can get through all the hard parts in life and still have faith. Hoping and believing in God, for me... That's what faith is. Hi, so... Faith has never really meant the same thing to me as everyone else around me. It seemed to. It's never been something I was really convinced by. Starting confirmation, I haven't fully gone away, but I'm starting to accept more of it. I still question, and as I've been repeatedly told over the past few days, that's normal. Well, but uh, I feel like this is an ending for me. It's a beginning. I'm not quite sure where this journey will end, but I'm excited to see where it goes, and one day we'll probably end up having this the same faith as around me, or if that's an oxymoron, maybe not. Hi, I'm Hannah, and I'm bisexual, and I use she, they pronouns. Um, being a queer person in the church as I got older and learned about the division between the church and the queer communities, um, the queer community, uh, it's been a constant struggle between the idea of organized religion and the ideals I 
personally hold as a queer person. Um, occasionally, it came to a balance. I'm not sure if I believe in the church proper. Um, but some of my earliest memories are going of going to church and like coming up to the front for children's ser sermon and playing with the bags that were given at the front of the sanctuary and but beyond that I don't know what I think specifically um the this experience this confirmation this learning more about the bible and what it means to be Lutheran and be Christian has um kind of immensely helped I don't think I can be the blind faith the Bible preaches. I don't think I can hold the um, God first mentality of that. I don't think that is currently how I can view the world. And so, but I can continue learning about faith and cautious faith. That is something I can do. That is a belief I can let myself hold both as a queer person and someone who's always been skeptical of the idea of organized religion. When I think of faith, I think about all the memories I've made before this pandemic. I think about all the friends I've made and the memories. And I plan on making more after this pandemic. Sometimes I question why God would put us through this torture, but then I remember his promise to never harm us again. When I think of God, I think of someone looking out for us, someone keeping us from impending doom. I think of someone who will be faithful and help us out whenever we ask. Hi, I'm Libby, and here's my faith statement. John 13 verse 7 says, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. That quote has gotten me to where I am now. Which is, using what I know about Jesus and God and the Bible and taking it beyond the church. Sometimes faith can mean so many different things, whether it applies to other people or yourself, or if it just means trusting or believing. For me, it means both. When I say trust, I mean trusting that God will make the right choice for me. When I say he is making the right choice for me, I mean leading me to make my own right choices. Now, everyone always makes mistakes, but that is where faith comes in. You have to have faith that God will forgive your mistakes. And then just like John 13 verse 7 says, later you will understand that God is not making choices for you. He is leading you to make choices to lead you to success.
We continue worship with the prayers of the church, mindful that the response to each petition is receive our prayer. Now is also the time that we welcome you to begin entering your prayer requests in the comments. We pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. As the fire of your gospel filled the disciples long ago, so ignite us and unite us for the work of your justice. Holy Spirit, receive our prayer. As students, educators, administrators, and staff come to the end of another academic year, we celebrate all that has been accomplished and release all that could not be fulfilled during these past nine months. Bring us into a season of rest and rejuvenation, thankful for all the blessings of our shared experience and hopeful for the future of each new generation. Holy Spirit, receive our prayer. We raise our compromands to you, O Christ, for your care. We rejoice in their faith journey and ask you to be their guide, guardian, and help. Let us continue to grow in faith, to commit to study of your word, and share the good news of the gospel with these young people and all your children. Holy Spirit, receive our prayer. Heal divisions in our world. Pour your mercy, compassion, grace, and reconciliation upon all your children, especially in the Middle East. Let hatred be turned into love, fear to trust, and despair to hope, that violent encounters may be replaced by loving embraces, and peace and justice could be experienced by all. Holy Spirit, receive our prayer. When people are in need, when people are scared, when people are mourning, you are our refuge. Draw close to those we seek, who seek your refuge today and bless those who need your healing, especially Kim Kravitz, Joseph Kravitz, Carl Bennett, Ed Vanis, Michael Kruger, Bruce Reinhold, Harry Coast, Susan Fisher, Marilyn Wagonet, Jesse Archer, Wei Dong, Bai Dao, Marion Stoll, Sue Kamens, and Dara Haas. Holy Spirit, receive our prayer. Many of us are exhausted from the trauma of these last 15 months. We have all been doing our best with what has been impossible. Remind us to be as gentle as we can with each other, to make time for rest and restoration, and invest in healing. We especially ask you to hold our pastors, Gary and Haley Bay, in your care, and pray they find grace and blessing in our community surrounding them. We also pray for Presiding Bishop Elizabeth Eaton, Bishop Satterley and Sidon staff, and for Reverend Carl Ballard at St. Paul Lutheran Church in East Lansing, Michigan. Holy Spirit, receive our prayer. For those who grieve and those who are approaching the end of their lives, we pray your peace and acceptance of the changing seasons of life. Keep us close to those we love, whether in this world or in the next, for the uniting love of Christ. Holy Spirit, receive our prayer. We now lift to you our individual prayer petitions in the comment section. We pray for Laura. We pray for Jabril and his mother's recovery. We pray for our confirmands and all youth who continue to journey forward in faith and ask the hard questions that create a culture in the church for expansive welcome, acceptance, and love. We give thanks for technology that continues to unite us in worship and prayer and faithful community. Receive these prayers, O Lord, spoken aloud and in the silence of our hearts, trusting in your mercy and your sustaining resurrection promise. Alleluia. Amen. I now invite you 
to pray the Lord's Prayer in your native language or a language close to your heart. Let us pray in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May you receive this blessing with an open heart. May the Lord bless and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace, guided by the Spirit. Thanks be to God.